All right, Shiny for Python, interactive apps and dashboards made easy-ish. Um, I am the CTO of a company formerly known as RStudio, now known as Posit. Shiny is both old and new. Shiny for R has been around since 2012. And uh, just coincidentally, uh, yesterday was the 10 year anniversary of the blog post introducing Shiny. So happy birthday, Shiny. But Shiny for Python is uh, right out of the oven. So we uh, just announced this uh, a few months ago at our studio comp this summer and it is still alpha software. Now, that being said, there's still uh, an enormous amount of power in this framework, uh, even at this uh, relatively early stage, so I'm really excited to share some of that with you today. So what is Shiny? Shiny is a framework for creating interactive apps and dashboards in Python. And it is designed primarily with data scientists in mind. And that has a couple of uh, ramifications. First of all, we don't expect you to have any web development skills. So no HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. And we use this reactive programming approach to interactivity that I'm going to talk a lot about today. And it's designed to be easy to use for people who have a data background. Now, that being said, uh, I'm not a data scientist. I'm a software engineer. I've been building uh, websites for 25 years now. And the thought of working full time on a framework that was like lowest common denominator or like kind of guardrails everywhere would be really frustrating for me. So I also designed Shiny with me in mind, or, or we designed Shiny with me in mind. So if you do have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript skills, which it seems like increasing numbers of people do these days, uh, then you can fully leverage them to extend and customize your Shiny apps. And this reactive programming uh, model that we're going to talk about today is, is not just easy to get started with, it's also powerful, flexible, and deep, and that's going to be a big focus of my talk today. So uh, before I get into this, there is going to be a bunch of code that I'm going to show today, and I want to uh, reassure you, uh, this is not a lean forward kind of a presentation, this is more sort of lean back, and you're not expected to be able to like read every line and be able to internalize this. Uh, that's, not, that's mostly not what this talk is about. There will be a couple places where I'll let you know if it's time to pay closer attention. But this is all going to be pretty broad brush strokes. So each Shiny app is composed of two main parts. Uh, first, you declare your user interface. So this is uh, Python code that generates HTML that will determine what your UI looks like. And this literally just generates HTML. That's what that app UI variable would print. And then secondly, you have a server portion, which, again, Python code, and this is the code that uh, provides the interactivity to your app. So it says what is going to happen when you move inputs and need outputs to be updated. And then finally, some boilerplate at the bottom to bring these two pieces together into a Shiny app object. Um, if you were to run that code, this is what it would look like. You, you could paste that code into uh, VS Code, and then if you install the uh, Shiny for Python extension to VS Code, you could hit that play button and it'll show it in a window on the right. Now let me show you an example of a more complicated user interface. And this is still not very complicated, uh, but there are a few more elements than just those, uh, the one input and the one output. Uh, this is an air mass calculator that um, uses the AstroPy uh, Python package to give you information about when it's a good time to look for uh, whatever celestial objects in the sky you're interested in making observations about. So you tell it what date you plan to go out and look at things, uh, and then the latitude and longitude that you're operating from. You can click on the map if you want, and uh, of course the objects that you intend to observe. And it gives you these, uh, these plots, as well as the sunset and sunrise times uh, for, those, for that day. So, uh, again, this is sort of like lean back, so don't worry about all this code, but I wanted to show that uh, there are all sorts of different types of functions you can use in a Shiny UI. So this is raw HTML in Python form, so that is uh, an H3 tag for a heading. Uh, you can put some markdown in there, rows and columns that you can nest arbitrarily, and then of course we have outputs and we have inputs. Now I also want to sort of zoom out on this code and there's sort of a shape to it, right? Uh, Shiny UI is made out of uh, nested function calls. 
And uh, this is a really nice property because it means that the shape of our code sort of mirrors the shape of the DOM that's being created in our UI. So in this case, the top chunk of the code is a header, and then you can see it sort of has this sibling in terms of the indentation, and that's the body, and that's mirrored in the shape of the UI. And then within this body, there's two columns, and it's the same thing uh, in the UI. So as your UIs get more and more complicated, it's really nice that the shape of the code gives you a real uh, big hint as to where you need to go look in your code to figure out where the certain button is or, or, or what have you. So, this summer, uh, we announced Shiny for Python, and we had been operating on it uh, in secret. So, uh, of course, when it was uh, announced, it made it to Reddit. So, our Shiny is coming from Python. And uh, people had a variety of reactions. <laughs> <laughs> Some people were excited. Uh, and other people said this. But it's just so easy to throw something up with Streamlit. And this is a, uh, an idea that has come up again and again since our announcement. Um, it's funny, I, I don't hear it so much about other Python app frameworks, but over and over again, but Streamlit is just so easy. So first I wanna examine, is Streamlit really that easy? Uh, how many people here have used Streamlit? Okay. Yeah, my question, if you exactly within what Streamlit is really good for is fine. But if you want to do something just a little bit different, you bang your head for, for days. Uh, I'm going to ask you not to give away the rest of my talk, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, just so easy, let, let's take this example of you have a straightforward analysis script that goes beginning to end, right? Um, maybe you export it from an iPy uh, or something like that. The promise of Streamlit is that you can take pretty much that same exact code, sprinkle in some Streamlit, and boom, interactive application. Now compare that to Shiny, which uh, even the little that you know from my previous couple of slides, Shiny has a shape that your app needs to fit into. It has an app UI, it has a server, and you need to put your code into that shape. So, uh, how are they able to do this? How are they able to make their code or, or their apps look so much like scripts? And they had a couple of really big ideas. And the biggest idea by far is this. On every user interaction, we run the entire app from beginning to end. So if you move a slider, if you click a button, anything you do, beginning to end, beginning to end. And Input controls are both declared and read with the same line of code. Now, this is not a session about Streamlit, so I'm not going to teach you um, the ins and outs, but, but just take my word for it that these two points are really big ideas, and they go together. You can't really have one without the other. And they also include a bunch of clever state management and diffing on both sides of, uh, of the wire to make this all feel very seamless, to feel like you're in this um, single page app. And it works. It is as easy as advertised, no question. I mean, their getting started is incredible. Like, you, you could write a Streamlit app falling out of bed. You might write one by accident. Like, it's, it's <laughs> okay. Which really does, it's a fair question then. Why Shiny for Python in a world where Streamlit exists? And, and by the way, when people ask this question, there's almost two questions being asked, right? Like, number one, why should I invest my time in learning about Shiny for Python when I know Streamlit. Um, but then the second question is like, why are you bothering? Why are you spending your time creating this, uh, this framework where nobody exists? So, um, as the gentleman alluded to, <laughs> the design of Streamlit, it works extremely well for simple and for small apps, but, but when you get to even moderately ambitious apps, uh, the same design that makes it so easy becomes a liability. So that's a problem for us uh, at our studio, now Posit, because for the last 10 years, our users have been doing stuff in Shiny, and what we've seen is that people want to create ambitious apps. Uh, they have cool things that they're doing, their work is complicated, 
and the apps that they create reflect the reality of their work. And uh, we're not just seeing people use Shiny for uh, throwaway apps or uh, you know, demonstrations of simple statistical techniques to undergrads, although there's plenty of that, but also, I mean, people are building businesses around their Shiny apps. People are relying on Shiny for key workflows in pharma, in finance, in manufacturing, and uh, the idea that we would build, we would give them the tools to build uh, up to a certain level and then no further, uh, that, that is super frustrating for me. So, in order to explore this further, I want to take a step back and talk about what even is an interactive dashboard or app. Like, what is the problem that both Streamlit and Shiny have to solve? And it's basically some version of this. We've got a browser, we've got a server that's running Python, and when the user does stuff in the browser, that results in inputs being sent to the server. And when the server receives those inputs, its responsibility is to come up with uh, changing outputs. It needs to create or update outputs in response to that input. And if you think of the server as a black box, the browser doesn't really care how it comes up with those answers. They just need to be right. And just for completeness, there's other things that the server might do that don't result in outputs changing but are still important, like writing to a database or posting to an API. Now, let's get a little more concrete, and this is where I will ask you to lean in a little bit. And this is just, picture this being a Jupyter-style uh, uh, analysis that you're doing that executes from, from top to bottom. You've got a bunch of parameters. These are things that you're likely to want to change. Okay. Uh, what's the data set you're analyzing? What's the uh, X and Y columns we're going to take a look at? Uh, what's a color map we're going to use to plot it with? And how many rows are we going to use to preview the data further down? Uh, in cell two, it loads the data as a CSV. Uh, cell three, it just grabs a couple of columns off of the data frame to create a new data frame. And then four and five, it previews the data, just the first n rows, and then plots it using that color map. Okay, like super simple. That, you know, you've probably done this like three times this week already. So, uh, what we really have here, if you look at it through the lens of an interactive app, is the top are inputs, right? Those are things that the user is going to want to change and then see things happen. And the things at the bottom are outputs. These are like cells that actually show you something. And in between, these are intermediate values, right? Uh, people don't see them, they just see the effects that they have on the outputs. So, how does Streamlit deal with this? As inputs change, what does Streamlit do? Restart and run all. Restart, run all, restart, run all. That's, that is the, um, the only model that it supports, that it just constantly reruns this thing. And that uh, is fine for a lot of apps, right? And it's fine for a lot of Jupyter notebooks. If your data is small, if your uh, everything happens quickly, then no big deal. But if that data is a 20 minute CSV, then uh, it's leaving some performance on the table. Like if this Y call changes, okay, so cell three uses Y call, so that's going to affect what happens to DF2, and then DF2 is used in these two places. So for sure we have to re-execute these, these three cells. But we don't have to execute the read CSV. And yet, Streamlit is going to do that anyway. Now, we can do an even more example with n row because this is used for only just grabbing the top n row uh, rows off the top of the data frame. So that's a super cheap thing. And yet, once again, uh, Streamlit doesn't realize this and it's going to execute the entire thing. OK. So as you can see, there is this sort of fundamental mismatch between uh, what Streamlit is doing and these sort of opportunities to do things uh, faster. And it's not just about performance. There is also um, flow control and state management is also compromised by this very simple model. And um, I admit, it feels a little weird to like bring up complaints about somebody else's software, and I don't love this, but I just want to make it clear that this is not something that I am inventing uh, because I'm trying to make myself look good. Uh, this is, uh, a, it, it is a serious problem once you get to a certain point with your Streamlit apps. So uh, these are all things that uh, pretty um, experienced Streamlit apps have said and uh, you know, to a person they all still say I love Streamlit. I love Streamlit, it is definitely not meeting my needs anymore with this run everything all the time model. Okay, so 
Let's take a look at what Shiny does. So if you look at the relationship between these different cells and start drawing lines where one cell affects another cell, you'll end up with a bunch of lines like this, right? And when I see arrows like this, I think to myself, that's a computational graph. And that gets me really excited because I'm a software engineer <laughs> and I know what to do with computational graphs, right? So let's take this same information and spread it out across two dimensions. Sure. We end up with something like this. And now this is very clearly a graph. This is the holy grail. If we can have this information, these blue arrows, then it's very easy to go from any of the inputs that are changing and just trace where does that lead us. And every node we touch needs to be re-executed, right? Simple graph traversal problem. Uh, there's just one problem. Even for this like, trivial example, that's a lot of arrows, right? And getting those arrows right is important. And in fact, that arrow was missing. And without that arrow, that one arrow out of all of these, if the data set changes, the plot doesn't update. And that's the worst kind of error, because it's not gonna show an error message, it's not gonna crash, it's just gonna give you the wrong answer. And in data science, I mean, is there a worse sin that your app framework can do than to give you the wrong answer confidently? So, luckily, Shiny does not ask you to draw arrows. All Shiny asks you to do is maintain these chunks of code. So you're not responsible for the relationships, you're just responsible for the nodes. So each of these pieces, each, all of this code, you need to divide into chunks that make sense for your problem, and then you have to provide a decorator that tells Shiny just a little bit of a hint about what the purpose of this chunk is. Uh, in this case, those two intermediate values, those are reactive calculations, meaning uh, the purpose of this code is to generate a value that's gonna be used elsewhere in this app. And then the things that need to be displayed to the user are marked with at output, and then you have to give a hint as to what kind of output this is, a table, plot, UI, mm -hmm. uh, and, and a number of other ones. And if you do this, if you maintain these boundaries and these uh, decorators, then Shiny will draw the arrows for you, and it will do it perfectly every time. I could do a whole talk just about how that part works, but that is not this talk. Um, now, because I think that's a little bit graphical and abstract, and uh, I don't want your imagination running away with how difficult it is to actually you know, reproduce what you just saw, I'm gonna show you uh, like what, what taking this code and turning it into what Shiny wants from you to show you what that looks like. So first we're gonna break the code into chunks, right? And in Python, those are functions. Chunks of code are, code are functions, right? And secondly, because df and df2 have changed from values to functions, Everywhere we're using df and df2, we need to now call functions, right? And then third, we add decorators, uh, as I described. And then finally, you put this inside of the server function that I talked about way in the beginning. And once you've done that, then not only do you have this, uh, this sort of newfound efficiency by only executing the minimum amount of code necessary, but uh, there, it turns out that this reactive programming model is so uh, beautifully well suited to this task of creating interactive applications that for 10 years we've just been constantly discovering new features falling out of the primitives that we wrote back in 2012. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these, but just to give you an idea, like these are features that we didn't have to like, you know, design carefully and then like force through through like clever programming tricks. Like these are things that felt like we discovered properties of reactivity just by grabbing different, um, I don't know, like the equivalent of subatomic particles and being like, oh, I wonder if something nice will happen. And then boom, we have like event cameras, we have time-based reactivity falling out from that. So, um, yeah. So I have a few minutes left to show some demos. Oh, my resolution just totally changed. All right. I can just zoom in. Okay, so this first example is just a simple uh, CPU monitor. Uh, this is just using matplotlib to 
graph each of the, uh, the 10 cores on my MacBook, and uh, I can use this chooser to change the color palette. Uh, I'm not sure why I put this one in there, but you can do that. Uh, you can freeze the output and unfreeze it. Uh, and you can choose the number of samples, and then down below I also have uh, a table that's format. This is a pandas table using Styler, uh, except for this little blue box that's just CSS. And uh, yeah, we can, we can change some of these parameters while it's running. And in order to change this from sort of your typical um, interactive app where you have to move some input for things to change to have it be sort of streaming, uh, it's just this one line. So uh, CPU percent returns the current snapshot for what your CPUs are doing, and this invalidate later says, this value is only good for this limited time. And when that expires, then uh, Shiny knows to go re-execute everything that, uh, or the minimum amount necessary to get all your outputs correct. Uh, so for my second example, I didn't realize how weird this sounded until I said it out loud during rehearsal, but uh, so I built this to teach my kids about compound interest, <laughs> as the kind of dad that I am. Uh, what this app lets you do is create um, a few different scenarios that uh, represent different saving strategies. Okay. And uh, I heard this rumor, I wanted to see if it was true, so I, so I wrote this a lot. You can put an arbitrary Python expression here, and that will determine for each year how many dollars is, is contributed, and then it'll grow at 7% interest. So we have two scenarios that are pre-populated here. The first one is uh, $2,000 a year until age 30, then stop. So this person only between the ages of 19 and 30 is going to contribute $2,000 a year, and then just let it grow at 7% interest. Now for scenario two, it's the opposite. They'll invest $2,000 a year starting at 30, never stop. So the person on the left has just this limited time to save, and the person on the right never stops saving. Uh, and the question is, how long does it take scenario two to catch up to scenario one? Obviously it's not gonna be you know, age 40, but is it 50, is it 60, is it 70? Any guesses, anyone ever seen this before? The answer is never. It never catches up. Uh, which has to be super frustrating if you're 30 years old or above. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's, let's just play with some other scenarios. Like what if uh, it's $1,000 uh, every year, you're in, you're out. I'll just skip to the end here. Uh, and it splits the difference. So you can, uh, you can add more scenarios here. Uh, and then you can take them away. And this ability to sort of dynamically add and remove UI and have it still participate in these outputs that are already sitting on your page, uh, this is another thing that sort of like fell out from reactivity. Okay, one more demo. Uh, this is actually uh, a demo that we uh, took from Plotly. And this is using the Plotly, I just gave away. Uh, this is using the Plotly um, iPy widget to display. And this is, um, what this is showing is Brownian motion, which is some kind of motion that molecules do. I don't know, I'm a software engineer. Um, and, uh, and we're seeing this in 3D. And I can click new data to keep generating new uh, random traces here. And some of these, uh, look pretty cool, and others like this are, it's kind of hard to tell what's happening because this is in three dimensions and this is a weird angle. So uh, you can use your mouse to sort of drag it around because this is plotly, but um, just to do something fun instead, I'm using Google's uh, media pipe library to track my hand and then I can turn it using my hand. Uh, so we're using, um, you know, there's code that's running in Shiny that takes these different landmarks on my hand and generates uh, a normal vector shooting out of my palm and then tries to orient the, uh, the plot in the same way. 
Now, uh, the reason I show you this is because um, we were playing with this, I was playing with this at home, and I showed my son, who is a senior in high school and aspiring uh, computer science major next year. And uh, the demo originally looked like this. Sorry, let me just make it a little bigger. I don't know if you can tell, but like, it, it's quite jittery. And I didn't even notice. I was like, can you believe this works? And he was like, why is it so jittery? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's, a, it's jittery because sensors are jittery, right? Uh, but he, you know, I thought he posed an interesting question, like, can we get that to not be so jittery? And we tried a couple things. We tried, like, not registering any movement unless it was more than a certain distance, and that was a stuttery mess. And, uh, and then we came up with the idea, like, let's just smooth it over uh, a certain number of samples, like the last five samples, we'll just do a simple mean, right? And uh, he said, well, that's it for me, I'm off the bed. And um, I texted him like six minutes later, I was like, the smoothing works super well. Uh, and it does. I mean, it's, it's a really big difference even with this very naive uh, sort of a, a strategy. Uh, so he came writing down and we looked at it together and it was fantastic. And uh, I show you this because the way I was able to implement this uh, was not um, not a smoother that was specific for this app, but I was able to implement a generalized reactive smoother. So you give it any reactive expression and give it any smoothing strategy that just takes a bunch of samples and returns one sample. And um, with just this few lines of code, uh, now Shiny apps can have smoothing on any input. Um, so. You know, I had written the slide first about like all these gifts that reactivity um, has to give, and it's crazy that like after ten years, we're still discovering these uh, these things every once in a while. So, uh, so Shine for Python is in alpha, but uh, you know we would love for you to give it a try. We would love feedback. Uh, if you are a streamer user and you think I'm full of crap, I would love to hear it. I'm all ears here. I am uh, uh, here specifically, uh, this QR code will be on the next page as well. Um, I am here to learn. The reason I flew out here for this conference is because I want to meet as many of you as possible. So I will be at the Posit booth all day tomorrow. Uh, and if you have any interest in interactive dashboards in Python or any other language, I would love to talk to you and hear your perspective. Uh, and that's it. So I have successfully given us, I think, plenty of time for questions. Back there? Yeah, so I, I saw that you had, uh, one example had matplotlib, the other one had plotly. Can you, can you use any graphing library or, or anything in terms of what you're presenting? Yeah, the question is, can you use any graphing library? Uh, so any of them that work with matplotlib, or, or have matplotlib as sort of the underlying rendering engine, yeah, for sure. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I forget exactly which ones those are. But yeah, Seaborn, Plot9 are certainly in that list. Uh, there's a couple others. Uh, and the other thing that we have that uh, you saw with the plotly example is that uh, we have a package called Shiny Widgets that is, um, it lets you embed IPy widgets into Shiny apps. And not just in the sort of static way, like you get a static snapshot of the HTML, but in the sort of live bi-directional communication way. Uh, that was another thing that we were able to extend Reactivity to do, is to, um, to sort of integrate with the uh, IPy widget model of communication as well. That is, I think, more highly experimental, um, because sometimes we've found that widgets work in Jupyter, but actually in some subtle way, you know, break the spec of how widgets are supposed to work. So, uh, but almost all the ones that I've tried work after some fashion. That being said, for things like Plotly and Altair and Vega that are like really important visualization libraries that are based in JavaScript, I think in the future you can expect us to do um, more tightly bound uh, integrations that the IPy widget stuff works great, but you are sort of moving from reactivity to an object-oriented model and back as you, um, not even object-oriented, but event-based. Uh, so my point being that, um, you know, Streamlit has like custom bindings for Altair and for, for all those other ones, and I think um, we'll almost certainly go down that road as well.
Theoretically, do you really need the decorators to be able to draw the arrows? Uh, yeah, the question was theoretically, do you need the decorators to draw the arrows? <coughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is going to get a little bit deeper uh, into reactivity, but these two different types of uh, chunks that you see here, they have quite different properties. Uh, the reactive calcs, they are lazy loaded. So Shiny is going to do everything it can not to ever execute any in, uh, intermediate values unless they are necessary for outputs. Whereas outputs are, they are needed. Like they in and of themselves have purpose. So for that reason, like we, we don't, we can't just infer what your intention is for each of these um, code blocks. So that's why um, we, we require at least a little bit. Now, do those need to be two decorators for those outputs, or they could definitely do one. That was a, just a choice that we made. Um, or does that answer your question, or? Yeah, I guess there's no way to trace through the code and figure it out, something like that. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about this tomorrow. I think we, I, we could have a really fun conversation, but um, I want to make sure other questions get answered. Yeah. Um, I've seen this kind of idea before, but I haven't heard the term in exactly like reactive programming. Is this like an emerging uh, approach, kind of like, and you, you foresee it being something that becomes more pervasive in the same way like async programming has? Sure. Uh, so reactive, the question was uh, reactive programming. Um, this gentleman has never heard that um, word applied to uh, this kind of approach. Uh, so I do have to caveat and say reactive programming means a lot of different things at this point. There are a number of different approaches to doing this sort of very dynamic kind of programming that are branded reactive, that actually behave in very different ways. Uh, this particular um, style of reactive programming is called transparent reactive programming, and it was pioneered by, I think it was Knockout and Meteor.js in 2011, 2012. Uh, this kind of reactive programming, I think, um, is one of the more successful ways to write JavaScript front ends these days. So uh, MobX and um, I forget a couple other like very major uh, Recoil, I think, is another one or something like that. Um, yeah, like these ideas have a lot of purchase in the JavaScript world. Um, but I will say, like reactivity in the in the general sense, that general term. I think you can think of it as any attempt to make the interaction between changing and moving parts a little more declarative and a little less imperative. Uh, a lot of as long as it meets that description, a lot of people are calling their stuff reactive programming. And uh, in general. That idea is on fire. I mean, there, there's just probably no JavaScript framework that doesn't call itself reactive in some way. React, right? The actual framework is called React, and it turns out it's not actually reactive. And uh, this felt, uh, the creator spelled it a great talk that was like, React is not reactive. Um, so, so, yes, it is an extremely mainstream concept in the JavaScript world. Um, we'll see what happens in Python. It seems like people are really used to callbacks right now. And, um, this is, you know, my first attempt to start telling the story about why you should want something more. Yeah. Do you have a hot take on why we do giant instead of dash? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I really wanted to get back to the QR code, but this is taking forever. Um, <coughs> else. Yeah. Um, so to be clear, every. Uh, app framework author has to make some decisions about what's important to them, right? There are very few free lunches, and the Streamlit folks um, did an amazing job at what they set out to do, which was to lower the bar as much as possible as to how much effort it is to get started making apps. And as I've, as I've shown, like, they, they had to sacrifice a lot on that altar. Uh, and Dash has some interesting things about it, and I think the, the biggest trade-off that they made uh, was in favor of making their entire model stateless, which means there is no, like this whole reactive graph that I showed you, that's all living in memory in Python, and for them, that all lives in the client. So that means like for us, we're trying to do as little work as possible 
to update your outputs. And for them, anytime anything needs to be recalculated, any inputs that are involved in that recalculation have to be uploaded to the server every single time. So that CSV you know, data frame that you downloaded uh, or, or that you read in, for them, if you want to reuse that, it's actually living in the client. And then every time you move a slider and some outputs update, each of those outputs is getting uploaded a fresh copy of the data. Uh, so you do end up with a stateless server, but at what cost? Uh, now, I mean, they know that this is, has this implication, so they have pages about how to work around this problem. Uh, but depending on the shape of your app, and I think for a lot of the Shiny apps that we've seen people build, like, you just wouldn't want to fight that battle when Shiny just makes all this sort of automatic just by programming in the way you naturally would. So. Um, is Shiny live? Is Shiny live compared to everything that Shiny with server can do? Yes, so uh, Shiny Live is a uh, deployment option for Shiny where you don't need a server at all. Uh, so using similar technology to PyScript, it's uh, also based on PyODive, which PyScript is based on, uh, you still have the same exact execution model, except we've just moved the server to be running in the background in your browser. Uh, which means, from a hosting perspective, you don't have to find somewhere to park a Python process like Heroku or something. You can just put it on GitHub pages or, or what have you. Um, so yeah, today Shiny Live does, does a lot. Uh, there are a couple of limitations that are sort of inherent to running Python in the browser. Uh, for example, if you need to connect to your database directly from your Shiny app, that's not something that's possible from Wasm today. And even if it was, would you really want to put database credentials inside of the client? Um, and there are some things that we expect to improve with the fullness of time, like a lot of packages that are on PyPI don't work in PyDi right now. Uh, and I, I have no doubt that problem is eventually going to be solved. But for today, you may be happily deploying to Shiny Live and then realize, oh, I installed this package and now I'm back in the real Python world. So, Winston, did I miss anything there? Is that? Uh, okay. Winston is the guy who actually uh, made the Wasm stuff happen. I tried to talk him out of it, and fortunately I was not successful. So. Oh, I'm sorry, someone over there would, yeah, you had your, your hand raised for a yeah, while. So. Oh, sorry, but behind you. Oh. <laughs> well, I just want to ask about Streamlit's uh, session stage and making it comparable. Yes, thank you. Uh, Streamlit has a feature called session state. I I'm sorry, I, I meant to talk about this. Uh, so Streamlit, it, they're very smart. They, they know that this run everything all the time has, you know, these sort of um, this sort of misfit as your as your apps get bigger and more complicated and uh, are doing harder to execute things. And there are a bunch of different things that they have uh, deployed in order to give you tools to hopefully get around these things. Uh, and I think two of the most important ones are, one, there's uh, all sorts of caching uh, mechanisms that they give you. So if you've already uh, you know, run this function with these arguments, then you can use the copy that is saved to disk instead of running it again. Uh, and the other is the session state. So normally with a Streamlit app, all of your local variables are just, they're just thrown out every time uh, the script re-executes, as it would be if you were executing a Python script from the command line, right? Uh, so they have a feature called session state that lets you store values in a dict that lives on between executions. And uh, people were rightfully really excited about this in Streamlit when this came out because it does give you like just enough of a finger hold that you can like do, you can you can get yourself out of quite a lot of jams, right? Um, but it's interesting. Like I don't deny that that works for some cases, but that kind of programming is extremely difficult to reason about. So you are now controlling the flow of your application using. I'll describe it as global variables and an unconditional go-to one, right? Um, and that's just a really difficult model to reason about. So, uh, so yes, I think session state is something that they had to do, and it does let um, Streamlit users who are determined keep going with Streamlit for a while longer. But, but I have, I, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to imply that every Streamlit user is going to hit these limits. I mean, for some Streamlit users. 
they might just happily want run it every time. Yeah, that's fine. I'll, you know, I'm going to build Streamlit apps for 10 years on that model, and that's you know that's great. I'm glad that uh, Streamlit exists. Uh, but for people who are trying to um, have more interactivity in their apps, uh, I think session state is only going to get you so far. I'm sorry, uh, right in front of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah you. Okay. Yeah. So the demos that you've really given, I mean, some of those are interesting, like adding and removing widgets. Yeah. Do you have demos uh, on your website for? Oh, you know, I forgot. Good. Some of that stuff, is, I think, would be just really helpful. Uh, I knew there was something I forgot. Uh, and there's a uh, requirements.txt in there, hopefully, you know what to do. Yeah? You talked about deployment, but what about the flip, the flip side of the PyDyes world where it's like multi user story? Like, is, is when multiple people hit the same URL, are they hitting the same computational context or not? Like, yes, great question, great question. Uh, it's actually, um, I think, a really surprising story for a lot of people. Uh, so, it, sort of left to its own devices. One Python process can serve n users. And you actually get to decide what data you share and what data is isolated to each session. And uh, it is actually as simple as, um, I'm not going to bring it up, but whatever reactives and state you put inside of that server function is specific to each session. Each session gets its own copy. So that server function, it's called server, it should really be called init session or something like that, probably. Um, every time someone arrives with a fresh browser, it runs that code. So in order to have a variable or a reactive be shared across many sessions, all you have to do is just move that declaration outside of the function, and now you have just one. So uh, it's very common in Chinese for R, for example, to have like, we have something called the reactive file reader. So you point it at a file and say, whenever this file changes, I want to do this, and usually it's like read CSV or something like that. And then all of your many, many connected uh, users can point to that same reactive. So when something changes on disk, the read CSV happens once, and then just the minimum amount of recomputation happens across all the sessions in order to make everybody up to date. I'm getting excited just talking about it. <laughs> yeah, I really love that aspect of this model. Uh, maybe one more question, and then we'll call it. Why, why not call it Pi Shiny? Why not call it Pi Shiny? <laughs> <laughs> why not call it? We had many meetings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think um, uh, reasonable people can disagree about names. Um, I I think I was more on the side of Pi Shiny, and um, I think it, there are a couple of things. Number one, do we have to go back and rename Shiny to our Shiny if we do that? And <laughs> how many web pages are we going to have to update for that? Uh, but also, I think, um, like from the marketing perspective, like we do have like a lot of web pages that talk about Shiny, and I think at least some people in the company felt like we have to say Shiny and Pi Shiny then everywhere. And you know, so there were just some sort of tactical problems that it solved. But like to me, Pi Shiny was the first name that came to me, and we were sort of talked into doing Shiny for Python. Yeah. But you know, I think if, at the end of the day, most people are not going to be like context switching between the two all the time, so usually it's pretty clear when you're talking about one versus the other. All right, again, I will be uh, by the deposit booth uh, here on the sixth floor all day tomorrow. I'd love to talk to you. Thanks.